Hello, everyone, <laughs> and welcome to a new Ember Academy webinar. I am uh, here today very happy after almost a month of pausing the webinars. We are back online and live on Facebook, welcome you, welcoming the, the gaming industry to, to a new topic. Uh, if the past webinars were a lot about uh, production, design, uh, targeting project managers in the gaming industry and so on, this time we have a topic that relates a lot to the quality assurance part. Um, we're welcoming everyone. I'm stalling as always for more of you to be able to join us. My name is Andrea Motok. I'm learning and development manager uh, in Amber. And if you don't know yet who Amber is, let me tell you, we are a full service game development agency. And the reason why we are doing these webinars for you and for the community out there is because we believe a lot in learning from each other. And uh, we are a, a community of people that invest a lot in, in learning. And we believe that we learn in connection with others. So so this is our way to uh, pay it forward as well uh, and leave these values of learning and community all together, sharing the info that we have with uh, everyone out there who is interested in developing know-how and skills as well. So uh, we are happy that you have you, we have you here with us. We know that we cannot talk or interact, but do not worry, we have two means of interaction today. Um, if, uh, if you want to ask questions or to give us insights and chat with us and you are on the Facebook page, uh, just leave a comment there and it will reach us and I will give it forward to the speaker of today. And if you are here with us uh, on, uh, on the Zoom webinar, just leave a question in the Q&A. Um, and for sure, at the end of the session, we will, uh, we will take it and answer to your curiosities. So uh, I am having here today, as you can see, someone who did not say anything yet, but will say a lot in the following 45 minutes. We have Mircea Stroe, he's a senior project manager in Amber. Um, he invests a lot of his time in growing the quality assurance team. And I'm really happy to have him uh, with us. He's interacting and he's overseeing the Mexico Amber team as well in quality assurance. So um, Mircea, I'm really happy we have you here today. Thank you for accepting the invitation to talk about agile quality assurance. That must be very interesting. Definitely. <laughs> so thanks, Andrea, and greetings to you all visitors from all time zones and regions. Yes, indeed. We have people joining from uh, US, from Mexico, from Romania, and I'm sure that at the end of the event, we'll see more countries. We usually have more people joining from different locations. This is, let's say, the, the beauty of work from home for the majority of us. Uh, if the a majority of our events were uh, live on site, so in our offices, we were welcoming students and people in our offices for these types of events. Now, the good thing is that that we have the chance to reach more people abroad as well in the same time. Um, and this is one of the reasons uh, why we decided to do the webinars. Um, Amitra, I think we've reached a quorum. I, I see a lot of people joining even here on Zoom uh, and on Facebook. We have, uh, we have people just coming in. Uh, I think we can officially open today's webinar. So the mic is yours. And guys, don't forget, uh, if you have a question, just leave it on the Q&A or on the comment on Facebook. And in the last 15 minutes of the webinar, we will make sure we answer to as much questions as possible. Mircea, the stage is yours. Well done. Welcome to another edition of our quarantine Amber Academy webinars. We are nearing the end of a year with unexpected challenges, putting once again our anti-fragility to test. And until everything slow, slowly gets back to normal, let's make ourselves comfortable, expand our awareness, and create a vision about how to make better games. And uh, this is basically like uh, uh, the core team uh, uh, that I selected for, uh, for today's uh, webinar. All right. And it's called Agile Games QA uh, Tailoring and Optimization. 
the reason for which uh, uh, I decided to pick up this topic is that uh, in February next year, we'll celebrate 20 years since the Agile Manifesto was published. And uh, in the meantime, the ways in which software is developed change a lot. And all connected disciplines have been uh, drastically reshaped by these transformations. And some of these went more deep, some only stretched the surface. But the only constant thing is change itself. And it is us that can lead this change in our areas and uh, push, uh, push the evolution forward, uh, uh, taking uh, initial, uh, initial action uh, before uh, uh, starting to adopt new trends and uh, creating a, a, a framework that will help us uh, to cope with, uh, with the challenges of the future. So in this context, I'm happy to, to shed some light over how we can bring uh, uh, an agile perspective on the way in which games are tested. And regardless of what neighborhood of the game development world you might dwell, it is our shared responsibility to advance the quality of the future games. And in order to achieve this, uh, our goal is to work on the seamless integration of all the disciplines and increase the collaboration all across uh, the software development life cycle. So this was the not so elevator elevator pitch of our talk today. Let's start uh, this uh, presentation with a, a bit uh, of introduction of myself. My name is Mircea. Uh, this is quite hard to pronounce uh, if you are not a Romanian. Basically, it comes uh, from, the, from the root word, uh, Slavic word, uh, mir, which means uh, tranquility uh, or peace. And I actually have a, I have a background in uh, theoretical physics. Uh, I had a chance to, uh, to attend uh, a full month uh, uh, studying the cosmic radiation uh, at the, the largest nuclear facility in Russia, and also had the chance to attend a workshop at the Large Hadron Collider uh, in, uh, in uh, Geneva. And I think I got in the game development industry by mistake and uh, stayed for the fun and challenges. And I, I think game development is the, uh, in a positive way, twilight zone of software development, where there are a few things that uh, are really set in stone and, and even fewer permanent solutions. So a lot of times, every new beginning uh, is a beginning from scratch and that keeps an inquisitive mind always engaged. And this is what I, what I love about uh, the people uh, in, uh, uh, involved in the game development process that they all possess inquisitive minds. And when you put everyone together, you always uh, get a fun and, uh, and challenging mix uh, uh, to, uh, to create new games. And uh, I've been working uh, uh, in the QA uh, leadership and management for 20 plus uh, titles on PC, consoles, and mobiles, ranging from, uh, from uh, big franchises like Need for Speed or FIFA, or Battlefield uh, to, uh, to small puzzle games uh, like uh, Ember's uh, infamous Link Twin. And during the last uh, three years, I, I've made a detour uh, in product management, working in Berlin uh, for, for a company uh, that developed an auto automated solution for, uh, for the digital publishing industry. And uh, there, uh, I managed to round up my expertise uh, by uh, uh, understanding how the development process actually works and uh, also implemented the uh, uh, lean startup framework uh, through which we uh, uh, the, you know, together with the team we delivered the first alexa skill being able to uh, uh, deliver a news brief on demand which in uh, german that would be uh, an alexa zusammenfassung bitte which is quite fun And what we're going to, uh, to uh, discuss today will be to, uh, to provide a, a quick overview of uh, the, the games QA world and uh, run one-on-one uh, -on -one comparison between uh, the, uh, like differences uh, of in, uh, between games QA and uh, software development, like or traditional software development. Then uh, we'll uh, investigate a little bit how we can uh, uh, create a full framework to support the development of games uh, to what, to what uh, timber we have uh, uh, as development support services, then we'll, we'll discuss a little bit what kind of challenges and pitfall uh, the integration of external QA teams uh, can, uh, can bring. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll try to actually mitigate and find a, a plan of attack of, and solution to overcome those challenges uh, through an alignment model between testing and development. And last, last we'll have a, a 
discussion about uh, different ways in which we can engage uh, the QA function uh, earlier throughout the, the game development life cycle and understand better the uh, gains that can, uh, can come out of it. And at the end, of course, we'll have uh, 15 minutes uh, uh, question and answers uh, uh, session for uh, any questions that might pop into your mind. Like as a, as a uh, brief homework for you guys, uh, I would uh, ask you from, uh, from uh, the outset to uh, think about three attributes of uh, the most unloved games, game, uh, game that you ever played. And I think if you guys want, it would be a perfect moment to like use the comments in Facebook as uh, to, to complete this. And uh, here on, on the chat, you can just add whatever you're thinking. So if you have, uh, have things, uh, these three games in mind, share it, uh, share it in the comments on Facebook or on the chat. <laughs> Sounds great. And uh, as a follow-up, uh, based uh, on all the attributes uh, in the uh, months to come, uh, I'm going to try to create a white paper uh, and uh, uh, determine how exactly QA could prevent or could have prevented uh, those problems uh, in the first place, based on all the, all the knowledge that uh, uh, we, we now have about uh, uh, how to test games better. Now, let, let's see exactly why, why, why is the game uh, development of a ga game uh, slightly different uh, than uh, the development of a normal app. So on one, to begin with, uh, with normal software applications, the developers want the users to be, uh, to be able to quickly identify exactly how to obtain uh, the desired results. So that means that uh, the most successful software allows the user to load the program and understand how to resolve a problem with as little searching and exploring as possible. Now, most applications will react in the same way each time a user does a specific series of actions. And these products are meant to perform the same function reliably. So that means that uh, once a problem is found, there is a high probability of recreating and fixing it, which makes uh, uh, things uh, quite easy, both for the developer as well as for the testers. Now, on the other hand, in games, all information is purposely hidden from the user, a uh, thing that makes games fun and worth exploring. Now, a game is a software designed to give, the, to give the user the least amount of access to the actions of the programs as possible, or at least uh, during the beginning phase. So game designers want the player to have no choice but to take time to explore the world and discover what the game actually does. So, they do this uh, in order to preserve the mystery of the world, the quest, and the fantasy. The harder it is, the more time it takes for the user to obtain the so-called desired results. So basically, a game uh, is an enormous and highly complex database with a shell that is built to obfuscate the purpose from the user. And it is designed to be unpredictable. Events uh, don't always function the same way twice. And things don't get... Uh, don't get uh, uh, easier when, you, uh, when we add to this mix uh, some artificial intelligence uh, that will actively try to outsmart the users. And because of this, uh, uh, the, the whole testing process uh, and the testing approach is, uh, is slightly different than uh, from uh, uh, what uh, a normal software tester would do. Because as a game tester, you are interacting uh, with an intentionally limited inf interface that is con constantly changing the way it functions as well as the way it looks. So it can be nearly impossible to know if what you see is what you're supposed to be seeing. And uh, I uh, called here a couple of the core differences between the game development and uh, the normal software development. And the first one is the extensive, extensive, extensive demand for creativity and artistic impression. And one of the reasons for this is that many of the game developers do not consider themselves strictly as working in the software business. In a lot of organizations, even developers doing programming consider game, gaming development as creative work rather than normal software engineering. And games are just interactive art. But they're fully comparable to movies. Being involved in a creative endeavor involves a tiny adjustment even to the hard disciplines involved. 
Now the next uh, uh, particularity would be the, uh, the fact that for the most part, uh, games uh, are way behind the rest of the software engineering world when it comes to automated testing. And a primary factor is limiting budgets. Test uh, automation strategies require a significant upfront, upfront commitment and funding that at this moment is hard to be attained by indie and mid-sized publishers. And in games, there are two main ways to handle automation. And one way is hooking its way into the game uh, where you need uh, some engineers to create entry points for that. So the so-called hooks. And uh, this is an intrusive way because you need special debug capabilities allowing uh, uh, to hook in and manipulate functionality. Now, introducing this kind of alien system uh, inside the software might not really mirror the way in which uh, real users would uh, likely interact uh, with the game. The other way is through uh, the so-called screen-based detection tests, which are also hard to, uh, to implement because games don't have a really deterministic behavior. So if interactions are randomly generated, then the same action won't always return the same results. And, uh, this accounts for a virtually unlimited ways of uh, interactions that makes the design of an adequate automation infrastructure extremely tedious. As far as I, I know uh, from the public reports, uh, well, one of the greatest uh, stories uh, regarding uh, automation for games uh, is the, the structure, the build verification system that Riot implemented for League of Legends and their current reports uh, 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 advertise the fact that uh, approximately 50% of all critical or blocking bugs are discovered in-house by these automation systems. But nevertheless, 50% still leaves uh, half of the work to be carried out by uh, the QA people. Now, the third uh, thing uh, is that uh, game industry ha has been moving uh, 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 rather slow from uh, the so-called creative chaos and ad hoc practices towards process thinking, but is still struggling uh, when finding the best solutions uh, for game-specific features and maximizing uh, the intangible fun factor. Well-defined software engineering techniques in the design phases often yield unsatisfactory results or don't work properly at all. And development suits created uh, for software development, for classical software development, do not always support well, uh, well uh, established games specific features, mostly because of their non-deterministic behavior. For instance, uh, if uh, you are in a fight with uh, the level uh, three boss, and uh, there is a two out of 10 chances that the boss uh, will be transformed into a rubber deck, a rubber deck after uh, uh, the, f the third punch, then obviously it is super hard to, uh, to get this, uh, this kind of behavior uh, uh, implemented uh, through, uh, through a software solution. And the last, uh, the last uh, uh, important difference here is that interactions with the other disciplines of the game development world also creates new challenges. Oftentimes, uh, artists have a creative, a creative process which is not clear for programmers and uh, uh, working together on building the intangible fun factor and artistic expression is a, you know, nap requires a, a lot of error and trial, which cannot be really contained by any traditional game development framework. Now let's, let's try to dissect a, a game and what exactly makes or breaks uh, a game or like the success of it. And uh, usually, uh, uh, whether a game will survive or not uh, boils down uh, to three, uh, three things. Uh, buggy games uh, and uh, bugs uh, and games that uh, have a, uh, like improper functionality uh, will almost always fail. Then uh, the games against fail because they can simply be boring. And the third reason for that is, is that sometimes, although uh, they might be uh, flawless from a functionality perspective, uh, or uh, have an increased uh, fun factor, factor and immersion, uh, they might still be, uh, not have uh, the monetization system that would allow the publishers to uh, support uh, its maintenance. And, oops. and at the core of, uh, of uh, 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 any uh, 
assessment regarding the quality of games, uh, uh, there is uh, obviously uh, the foundation, which is flawless functionality and uh, users always need a reliable software. The next critical ingredient in, uh, is the user experience. And users are extremely sensitive uh, uh, to usability issues, especially the, uh, the gamers. There are hundreds of menus and settings in a normal game and you know, users need to figure out how to get the basics right in a relatively steep learning curve. So if you, if you can't figure out in a relatively short amount of time how to use something, you might, we might end up not using it at all. Now, the third as aspect, and this is one of the most intangible ones, uh, is actually the immersion. And immersion and getting into a sort of dreamy flow state is probably the, the part that qualifies uh, building a game as an art. Uh, I only want to remind everyone uh, at the same time that we are also seeing a transition from the millennials to the generation Z, which is a, a digital native one. So uh, the expectations uh, of the new generation of users in regarding to uh, you know, player experience and immersion are greater than uh, everything uh, that have been in the past. And at the top of the pyramid, obviously, we'll have uh, the monetization system. So basically, if the, the foundation uh, is not working, uh, uh, there will be uh, no, uh, no successful games, and that is functionality. If uh, functionality works, but uh, the, uh, the users can't figure out how to actually use the game as a product, uh, then uh, the game will fail once more. If uh, the users can figure out how to use it, uh, but uh, the player experience uh, uh, is not uh, immersive enough, then obviously uh, users uh, will, uh, will uh, decide uh, uh, to move on to the next game. And on top of everything, uh, there, there needs to be a, a smart monetization system in place in order to uh, uh, make the business uh, profitable from a business perspective. And now I think we can, uh, we can uh, analyze a little bit uh, uh, how uh, a normal game uh, is structured from, uh, from a technical perspective uh, and see uh, again, what are the differences between, uh, uh, between uh, testing software and testing games. And the first thing uh, is, the game as an app. And uh, here, uh, besides all the functional uh, stuff that needs to be tested, there are some areas confined uh, to the expertise of uh, the game testers. And that is uh, the, the fun factor testing. And for instance, uh, unlike other kinds of software, games must be fun. When you have a, uh, a payment module in place, the payment module doesn't need to have any kind of fun factor but games must be fun and immersive. And in, in, able to, in order to be able to break down the fun factor into actionable test cases, you need the large domain knowledge of games, which is actually what you'd find uh, in a uh, solid uh, game skating. Then a game need, needs to be balanced. So there is a lot of balancing testing uh, going on uh, during the development of a game. And there, there, there is the balancing of levels, the balancing of uh, difficulties, uh, the balancing of weapons, boosters, or equipments, and the balancing of different character options, like race, class, attributes. On top of that, uh, there is AI testing, testing with uh, different uh, attributes of an AI and how it reacts uh, in different uh, situations is absolutely critical for, for the success of a game. How well it mimics human behavior, it's a, uh, a hot topic. Another one is the survival instinct because uh, the AI needs to look for cover in a firefight. And uh, it also needs uh, to uh, get into a hunting mode and uh, not only react to players' actions, but proactively devising an attack tactic. Then it's pet fighting. And I think that this sums up uh, all the particular kinds of testing uh, that uh, would be added up uh, to, uh, to the normal functional uh, requirements that you would test uh, uh, when considering uh, the game as an app. Besides that, we, we need to consider that a lot of games have physics engines, which affect both gameplay and animation. And now many of today's uh, mobile games are based on open source uh, commercial games engines, such as Unreal, Unity 3D, CryEngine, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, with this, uh, there are two uh, main uh, things uh, that uh, require extra attention. 
And that is uh, the game level and the uh, world testing because a high number of instances uh, uh, where uh, assets are used uh, in a normal app. Uh, oh, actually, a normal app might use uh, uh, the same asset uh, in maybe five, six menus, but uh, in a game, you'd have the same asset uh, reused in maybe 100 plus different uh, instances. So that means that the test team must find all the instances where those assets are found and uh, test them for missing geometry, for holes, or sticky spots. Besides that, uh, the physics uh, need, need to be realistic. Uh, no matter if uh, the game is taking place uh, in a world that is simulating uh, our universe and obeying the current uh, physics of, uh, of law, or, or in a different universe with a completely different uh, physics, uh, uh, the, the breakable geometry and uh, the dynamic behavior uh, need to be consistent with uh, with the behavior uh, of and the laws uh, in that universe. Now the third uh, thing uh, is the platform testing part. Uh, this can range from mobile platforms to uh, console platforms, and uh, there is, there is a lot of uh, investment uh, carried out in uh, uh, providing compatibility testing. It is not. Uh, uh, it's not enough that the game would run on the latest iPhone, but you also need to, to ensure that uh, the game is uh, launching the correctly and it provides a, a great user experience on uh, your grandma's uh, iPhone 5. Or on, uh, for those people that might still be using the uh, Internet Explorer versions. Now, the third part, and this, this one, uh, one uh, critical aspect, uh, especially for monetization for, uh, for the current generation of games uh, is the backend part where testing notifications and advertisements and live ops is absolutely critical uh, in order for uh, uh, the monetization of the, of the game to be uh, uh, successful. And obviously the last part uh, uh, is the connection. Uh, now, even though other kinds of software communicate with other users, and uh, servers, it is often uh, to a lesser extent and less sensitive than uh, what happens in a massive multiplayer online game. Now, most of the games, to, uh, mobile, mobile games today have a server client interaction requiring a login, an uploading of data and uh, downloading of data. So this uh, makes room for uh, a lot of uh, game specific uh, uh, types of testing, depending on the multiplayer interactions being synchronous or asynchronous, uh, considering uh, uh, network stability, fail connections, uh, lagging issues, uh, scoring updates in leaderboards, or invisible players. And it would be great if you think uh, what, what uh, was the nastiest connection bug that you encountered uh, uh, recently. Now, to, put, uh, to sum everything up, I think the biggest challenge is that uh, uh, the game, uh, uh, game uh, development and game testing world uh, has nowadays are uh, the fact that uh, there is no industry testing standards. There, there are lots of, uh, of books uh, regarding professional uh, game testing and uh, designing uh, key processes, but most of, uh, most of these results uh, uh, are the, the ex based on the experience uh, of people that uh, worked uh, in uh, the key department uh, of big publishers during the last 20 years. And the thing is that uh, most of these uh, uh, best practices uh, doesn't represent uh, a real uh, uh, industry standard, but rather a set of uh, reactive measures uh, that uh, proved uh, successful for past games. But there is no actual guarantee that uh, any of these uh, would uh, work uh, for, uh, for challenges uh, that uh, the new generation of games uh, uh, brings along. Then test planning and design are not yet a structure engineering type of science. Obviously, uh, even now, uh, uh, designing a test strategy, it's halfway uh, uh, in between uh, having a, uh, like a, a rigorous mathematical uh, uh, science uh, uh, behind, uh, behind it uh, and being uh, an art where you need uh, to uh, consider all the constraints uh, that are typical uh, to uh, creating a successful game. And last part, and this will uh, bring us uh, uh, to, uh, to the topic of agility, is that uh, the relationship between uh, development and QA 
didn't really evolve much uh, beyond the sequential link of the software development uh, life cycle. And uh, we'll get back to that uh, uh, in, the next, uh, uh, in the next slides. Now, considering uh, all, all this uh, uh, huge uh, uh, environment uh, uh, of uh, game testing uh, and uh, uh, the large number of uh, tests and scenarios that need to be covered uh, uh, before a game is released, uh, uh, we now focus not only uh, on uh, classical quality control, where you'd have uh, testers uh, just uh, button mashing and trying to find uh, uh, the bugs uh, with minimal documentation. But uh, we, uh, we have a, uh, a complete uh, uh, revamp way uh, to tackle uh, the QA process. And I can, uh, I can give uh, the, example, the example of Amber, where we are a game development agency with uh, the mission to set the games industry standard in development services. Uh, and we also have an integrated model for development support services considering the QA process as a strategic responsibility. When considering uh, quality in the context of game development, there are four dimensions that one needs to take into account. And uh, the first one is uh, uh, the relationship uh, between QA and development teams. And QA needs to uh, constantly provide value uh, for that. And uh, in order to do so, uh, we, we here take ownership of the end-to-end -end testing process, allowing uh, dev teams to concentrate on, on core innovation and, uh, and development and providing uh, bug reports uh, with uh, all the information uh, that uh, would allow the dev team to understand the bug uh, as uh, fast as possible. Then uh, there is a, a shared responsibility of uh, quality assurance to uh, create value for the end users. And we actively represent the voice of the customer and the user needs, striving to create user-centric test strategies. And uh, this is one of the hottest topics uh, uh, that uh, this presentation, uh, I hope, will uh, uh, support. The one that uh, we always need uh, to design a user-centric uh, games testing strategy. Then uh, we always team up with partner dev QA teams, sharing expertise and creating an unbeatable QA partnership committed to evolve uh, the quality of games. And the last but not least, uh, we always look at the, the game uh, uh, from, a, from the bigger picture and fulfill the testing needs associated with the game being not only an entertainment solution, uh, but a product and thus supporting the business objectives of our clients. So, in order to uh, navigate a little bit uh, uh, the labyrinth of uh, different uh, uh, sub-disciplines of uh, gaming QA, we can uh, talk about uh, the mobile games QA uh, and uh, also having uh, 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 expert uh, embedded QA testers that can uh, uh, support the development teams uh, during the pre-integration phase and the early phases of the project uh, with any kind of technical uh, uh, challenges and that whole request uh, that might come along. We, uh, we represent uh, the voice of the customer uh, through uh, customer support and ensuring uh, that uh, all the information that we get uh, from the users uh, is uh, fed back uh, in, uh, in the development process uh, through, uh, through having a, a, a dedicated uh, uh, product strategy in order to improve the, the, the defects reported as well as uh, for, uh, uh, for business in order to understand uh, uh, what, what uh, the users actually uh, wish. Then we also have a live monitoring uh, when, when we, uh, we can, uh, based on the analysis uh, of uh, uh, usage data and how, how the uh, end users are actually using the app, uh, determine what uh, the best solutions would be in order to uh, level up the quality. And uh, we also have the specialized uh, Apple, Android, Sony, so first party testing that uh, makes sure that uh, uh, the apps are ready for uh, submission uh, uh, with a minimal risk uh, of being rejected uh, uh, during the first party assessment. And uh, my favorite one, uh, uh, which is the benchmark kind of testing. And uh, here we take uh, an unreleased game and uh, we measure frame rate, uh, GPU utilization, CPU, network usage, battery consumption rate, and temperature, uh, and uh, plot the values measured for the game against uh, 
uh, competitor games that are already live in the app stores. And I think uh, uh, the funniest uh, uh, kind of test uh, that uh, Gaming K uh, has developed uh, is using an infrared thermometer in order to uh, uh, measure the temperature increase uh, after prolonged uh, uh, gameplay. Now, in terms of uh, uh, the way in which uh, the classical uh, uh, software uh, development cycle uh, is applied uh, uh, when developing a game, uh, uh, it is uh, in 75% of the case uh, uh, a cool concept uh, uh, being designed by a bunch of uh, designers and uh, producers uh, through pre-production and brought uh, to, uh, to the state of uh, a relatively functional prototype. After the prototype uh, is ready, uh, we have the implementation phase where uh, the uh, artists and the programmers are onboarded and uh, uh, the, the game uh, starts to, uh, to gain a critical mass uh, and uh, uh, makes uh, fast steps toward, uh, toward release. Well, now it is usual uh, in, in this phase, uh, like halfway uh, through the implementation phase when uh, the, the first plans regarding quality assurance uh, are being made. And uh, uh, this leads to, uh, to the test uh, phase uh, coming in the post-production uh, after the, almost the whole game is being developed and uh, having uh, external QA uh, focusing on uh, bug hunting uh, while all the programmers are focused top heavy on uh, fixing the bugs. And uh, there is a, a major flow uh, in, this, uh, in this model. Uh, because when considering uh, how, how the cost of quality evolves uh, uh, in, in this model, we, we need to uh, consider that uh, the cost of quality is always broken down in the cost of good quality and the cost of bad quality. And the cost of, cost of good quality has two components. The cost of prevention, where you normally find uh, uh, any, up, any upfront uh, uh, investment uh, in an automation strategy. Uh, you, you have uh, automated code review processes, uh, maybe strategies for containing technical risk, uh, but also design testing. And then uh, there is the appraisal cost, which actually translates in the actual quality control cost where you have professional testers testing the game. By the same token, the cost of poor quality has also two components. And one of these is the internal failure cost, which amounts to the overall costs in fixing the bugs, uh, as well as the external failure cost that are the bugs that degrade the user experience and uh, uh, make user uh, uh, quit playing the game. And normally uh, with uh, uh, in a good planning uh, uh, framework, uh, the, the strategy for tackling the development of a new game should uh, have a balance between uh, the cost of good quality and its two components as well as the cost of bad quality uh, and uh, its, uh, its two components. And now the problem is that the later you bring on the quality team and uh, the later on you start uh, detecting uh, the critical bugs, the relative cost uh, to, bug, uh, to fix bugs uh, is increasing uh, through each, uh, uh, exponentially through each uh, phase of the de uh, software development lifecycle. Just to, uh, to add some numbers here, the, the worldwide software failure cost reached uh, in 2016 around $1.1 trillion. And oftentimes uh, there is no way around. So basically, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, delay the onboarding of the QA team till the late stages uh, of the development, and uh, there is uh, no, virtually no QA professionals uh, working, on the hand, uh, working on the game before, uh, uh, the, not only do the costs are uh, increasing uh, for uh, uh, detecting and fixing the bugs, but also the technical risk. Because if, the, if uh, uh, any kind of agile framework is uh, uh, based on a, a loop structure uh, that uh, includes several loops uh, feeding, uh, feeding uh, back into each other, what we would see in a typical three sprint release, uh, let's say after the game was uh, released and new features are developed, is that usually during the first sprint, the, the code is being written. Uh, so developers are working on feature development. Uh, and sometime in sprint two, 
uh, the, the first case uh, tests start uh, during the pre-integration phase and they mostly have an ad hoc, ad hoc structure. And then uh, it is in sprint three when uh, uh, QA takes the stage and uh, we have a full team of professional uh, fo focusing on uh, integration and the regression tests. But now the, the biggest risk with this approach is that uh, you will have most of the bugs uh, discovered and fixed towards uh, uh, the end uh, uh, of the software lifecycle. And uh, fixing a lot of bugs uh, shortly before the release increases uh, enormously the uh, technical risk and the probability that knock-on bugs will, uh, will be triggered uh, by each bug fix uh, that is made. And uh, in order to mitigate all these issues, uh, uh, one, one of the most solid uh, uh, approaches would be uh, to design a, an alignment model between uh, uh, the uh, uh, development and the quality assurance functions. And usually uh, uh, end user satisfaction is the top objective uh, of any quality endeavor. So the end result uh, of um, uh, the, the work of all disciplines is uh, having some uh, happy end users that love uh, the games. And in order to, uh, to get those uh, happy users, uh, uh, we need to account for uh, testing strategies that uh, aren't uh, functional centric, uh, aren't uh, requirement centric, but are 100% uh, user centric. And uh, normally uh, when, uh, when considering the, the game uh, as, as a product, uh, uh, we, we always start uh, uh, from uh, the user needs and uh, uh, from a product strategy. So there are some users identified, uh, like some sort of hardware, uh, hardcore players uh, that uh, uh, would definitely play a certain kind of games. And then uh, there is uh, the publisher's uh, business strategy that uh, would consider transforming uh, those needs uh, into, a, into a functional product. But uh, in order to get the functional product, you need a development uh, strategy in place that uh, will ensure that uh, the code is written and the product is actually delivered. And uh, in order to have uh, the product delivered uh, and uh, a functional software system, you need a QA strategy in place that uh, uh, is able to ensure uh, that uh, uh, what, uh, what will reach the, the users uh, is a high quality game. Now, the development strategy and QA strategy are the key pillars of the product strategy, which co converts the user needs and business strategy into a user and business value. And full alignment of these pillars is necessary in order to ensure that uh, a joint uh, action is in place between all disciplines with minimum waste. And a key prerequisite for this is to ensure that throughout the business, uh, throughout the whole business value generation chain, information can be decoded identically uh, bef uh, between all disciplines. Because when we think uh, uh, at, uh, at this diagram, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, we have a business uh, uh, and product people that uh, mostly talk numbers and money. And then we have the development people that uh, mostly talk uh, uh, in terms of uh, code, in terms of design. In the third part, uh, we would have the QA strategy and the QA people that would talk in terms of bugs. And uh, uh, in the middle, we have the user uh, that uh, would just think, uh, well, today I'm bored and uh, I need a, a fun game uh, to play. And uh, it's extremely important uh, to ensure that, uh, uh, and in order to build a shared vision about uh, how, uh, how the users uh, can be, uh, become happy with, uh, with a fully fledged uh, functional uh, product, uh, uh, all disciplines are using the same language. So information is passing through four, four uh, important strategic nodes. And that is the producer, that is the design lead, uh, the, that is the engineering and the QA manager. And it, it's important to ensure that everyone uh, is on the same page. 
And uh, based on this alignment model, uh, uh, it is absolutely critical uh, that uh, uh, in order that In order to remove uh, any kind of, uh, of issues and differences between all the disciplines, uh, the LIMO model uh, involves uh, uh, the synchronization uh, of the working cycle and uh, uh, provides a common denominator uh, between uh, uh, having a, a flawless uh, development strategy, uh, a great case strategy, and synchronization between uh, the development uh, uh, capabilities and uh, the QA capabilities. And uh, having a strategic, uh, strategic alignment in place at the start of the project uh, uh, and uh, uh, running through the execution phase ensures uh, that uh, all the teams uh, are running into the same direction. And in, in this ideal model, we would have uh, uh, the user needs, user types and user behavior at the start of the value generating uh, uh, chain. And uh, in, the, in the prototyping phase, uh, these will be transformed into business requirements, use cases, and uh, user, user acceptance tests uh, through the help of QA professionals. Now, further, further down the line, the business requirements uh, uh, will be broken down into design specs and technical specifications and uh, finally, into uh, QA test cases. And this is done uh, by the collaboration between product, design, engineering, and uh, QA. And the result here is that uh, uh, in the end, we have a user centric strategy that converts the user needs throughout uh, uh, all, all the phases uh, uh, of the product development uh, into, uh, into some uh, uh, meaningful outcome that can be bugs. It can be a test cases, uh, but also a qualitative assessment of the business hypothesis that supported uh, the development of the product in the first place. And this happens exactly into a, a left shift uh, QA process uh, that pushes uh, uh, the QA uh, uh, involvement uh, in the earliest phases of product development. And the rule of thumb here uh, is that if the, the acceptance criteria are broken down at the start of feature release into some test cases that can facilitate the qualitative assessment of the product hypothesis be, before production deploy, uh, feedback can be provided uh, before the actual release, allowing for, uh, uh, for last minute uh, improvements uh, uh, that can uh, boost up the success uh, of the final uh, uh, deployed product. At the same time, uh, the, uh, this uh, reshape uh, of, uh, of the K involvement scheme is also maximizing the output of the K function through uh, the early involvement and alignment of uh, the testing and development uh, activities. And now, uh, lastly, there are a couple of uh, uh, ways in which uh, the K function can be integrated earlier in uh, uh, in uh, the development life cycle. And usually the traditional format uh, for mass QA is having uh, uh, the super test array uh, involved in the last phase uh, of the cycle, which is the uh, phase uh, uh, where we have uh, uh, some uh, granular test cases defined. We have some release candidates built. Uh, the testers are uh, focusing uh, on uh, hammering down any kind of functionality issues, but they have uh, a minimal understanding of the designer requirements of the technical architecture and uh, the business rational uh, behind what uh, they are testing. Now, as the name uh, implies, in the single tester model, super test array is uh, involved in all stages throughout the release. This has the advantage of continuity as one person's, a person begins learning about the business requirements from the very beginning and continuous building knowledge to each stage. The disadvantages of this model include the, the over-dependency uh, on one person and the expectation that this person must be well-versed in a wide range of skills, ranging from requirements and analysis to specialized functional testing. Now, another risk, uh, obviously, is uh, that, uh, that of a bottleneck or overload, uh, because especially when there are no uh, additional QA available. 
The second model, uh, uh, it is a bit more balanced, uh, but not 100% balanced. And here we would have uh, uh, one tester, Super Tester A, that will work with uh, all aspects of the project, uh, uh, including the design uh, uh, specification phase. Then tester B will, uh, will join in the detailed design stage and be responsible for testing uh, uh, till uh, the release candidate uh, uh, is delivered. Now, in this model, uh, uh, this is more the most common uh, embedded QA model uh, where uh, we have a, a super technical tester uh, that works uh, together with the development team in the pre-integration phase. And uh, we have a slightly uh, uh, generalist tester uh, in the last phase working on uh, uh, mostly on functional test cases. And then there is uh, the last model uh, where we would have uh, uh, two testers with a, a slightly uh, a different uh, kind of specialization. We have the first tester that uh, would be working as a, uh, as a product analyst, uh, uh, will be involved uh, in the development team, understand the, the tech requirements of the product, uh, and then be able uh, to break down the design requirements uh, into uh, some uh, criteria that can be tested uh, by a QA team. At the same time, uh, there will be virtually no, uh, no knowledge transfer required uh, because uh, the tester B uh, would also join uh, in the design requirements phase and uh, will be able to uh, cascade uh, the knowledge uh, into uh, defining the high level test cases and granular test cases that will support uh, the uh, release candidate testing. So if we would uh, be uh, to take three takeaways uh, uh, from, uh, from this uh, discussion, uh, the first uh, thing is that uh, if a team believes that uh, they are agile, but uh, there is virtually nothing changing in regards to the testing process, there, there is still a lot, some, uh, a lot of learning ahead, then uh, ensure the design people uh, and QA people know each other and agree on methods of collaboration as of day one. And consider involving a QA person, uh, maybe even uh, on a, as a temporary assignment to, uh, to help the product team uh, during the discovery and prototyping phase uh, to, uh, to break down this criteria uh, into uh, test cases that can be validated by uh, QA. And this was, uh, this was uh, uh, most of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mirta. And uh, yes, we do have questions. So uh, we have five more minutes left. I'll select some, uh, some of them for, for you to answer. Um, and thank you guys for being here with us and for being very interactive on the chat and asking, uh, asking, uh, asking questions. So uh, there's one very interesting Mirta um, and it's a, with a bit of a comment. So here it goes. Uh, I would imagine that AAA games like the Assassin's Creed and the Cyberpunks are impossible to be QA automated. How far along are we from automating QA on games featuring more simple mechanics like match free S? What do you think? Well, considering uh, uh, the industry reports uh, uh, for, uh, for, for Disney, for instance, uh, there have been a, a approximately 17 degree uh, penetration rate for uh, test automation uh, for uh, match three games. So this is the current uh, state, uh, state of things. Uh, uh, I expect uh, that uh, uh, we are nearing a revolution in regards to uh, the way in which uh, we are doing QA, especially through uh, using uh, AI and uh, machine learning uh, to uh, get some bots navigating through, uh, through the app and uh, simulating uh, uh, user actions. But mm -hmm. yeah, basically uh, we are now under 20% uh, uh, and uh, that uh, happens only in big companies uh, that can actually allow investing upfront uh, into automation. Cool, that's great to know. And uh, there's one more that I would like to, to ask you. 
uh, it's about the fact that several games titles have been deemed rushed or lacking polish, Cyberpunk being the most notable. Has the pandemic affect QA efficiency by messing with team alignment and information flow? You said a lot about information flow and the need for alignment, so let's see. Has it affected it? Um, well, uh, let, let's uh, uh, break down uh, the question uh, into two parts, uh, mm -hmm. whether uh, uh, the pandemic affected uh, the industry and uh, the level of collaboration uh, overall, or if uh, rushing uh, the game uh, uh, was a consequence uh, of the pandemic. Uh. Let's take it one by one. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, in, uh, considering the traditional way uh, of doing things uh, uh, and having uh, uh, the QA uh, slightly separated uh, from the rest of the team, joining uh, in uh, the late phase of development and uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, the requirements uh, as soon as possible in order to be able to test uh, efficiently, uh, the pandemic didn't have uh, much, uh, much of an effect uh, in terms of uh, exec speed of execution uh, or uh, uh, the QA process uh, overall. In terms of, of uh, rushing the release of the game, uh, this uh, uh, obviously a, a business decision uh, where uh, sometimes uh, uh, QA might uh, not be uh, involved uh, at all. That's great. And uh, there's one advice uh, that uh, some from the audience here is asking you, uh, and it's about the upgrade of the level of a tester. Uh, from your experience, because uh, you've, uh, you've seen multiple teams, you've coordinated multiple QA teams, what would you recommend besides the actual experience of the tester? Uh, what would you recommend in terms of improving knowledge or skill set for, for a tester to level up? Well, I think there are three uh, three uh, key areas uh, of improvement, uh, and one uh, is uh, uh, the product knowledge and uh, trying to understand the business rational behind the uh, behind the features. Uh, for instance, uh, sometimes uh, if uh, if a level is too hard, uh, and uh, that level uh, and the fact that it is hard uh, uh, makes users uh, leave the game. Uh, and uh, affects uh, engagement, uh, the producer and the game team uh, would decide uh, to add some extra balance. So the key people uh, need to understand uh, what is the reason for the changes that uh, appear in the game uh, uh, and what was the intent uh, of these modifications. And this way uh, they can uh, uh, get, uh, get a better image uh, about uh, how that uh, uh, feature would impact or is expected to impact uh, the end users. The second, uh, the second part would be uh, increasing uh, uh, the technical understanding of the game. Uh, it is not enough to, uh, to stick only to functionality, but rather having a, a deep understanding of the software architecture uh, behind it, because only in this way uh, you can uh, uh, develop a sound strategy for finding uh, uh, in-depth bugs. Thank you, Mikja. Uh, and I see that questions are still coming in. Um, I uh, I will I will just make a note of these questions, and maybe we comment on the Facebook page uh, with more comments because our time is up for today. Thank you so much, Mikja, for sharing these insights with us. Uh, hey, we needed something. <laughs> yes, uh, indeed, we needed something on quality assurance as well to to end up and wrap up the webinars um, um, that we had so far in multiple disciplines. So um, it's been uh, it's been quite a, a few topics for us uh, that we shared with you guys in our Ember Academy live webinars. We hope to see you next year as well with more insights and more topics from Ember people. And not only, we also have guest speakers to share know-how with you. Stay safe, have happy holidays, and thank you for being here with us. Hey, thanks everyone. Stay healthy. Stay, stay healthy. Bye guys. Bye.